Getting Social Robots Ready for School. Gould Peter Colin Hill and Christopher Addison Glenbrook Advanced Concept Institute, 9 Glenbrook Road, Glenbrook, NSW, Australia. Introduction. Getting Social Robots Ready for School conjures up images of a small droid in an oversized school uniform and new shoes walking into the entrance of a school. It could well be possible that some laboratory, in some country somewhere is developing this very approach, but we are at a much humbler stage. We have clear plastic boxes that contain what is essentially mobile phone components. These are connected to traditional science demonstrations. Interactivity is a fundamental starting point for engendering a social rapport with technology. The payoff is that somehow it feels more natural. It winds up being used more effectively. We are on the threshold of embedding that interactivity into a social context of a lesson or mission. By engineering data collection gleaned from student responses to preparatory podcasts and lessons, the units can address students by name and engage in natural conversation. Which in natural conversation. We are developing innocuous plastic boxes to function as social robots. They are getting ready for school, but they are not there to be taught. It is the teachers who are the ones that are failing. Whatever it is that they are doing, they are not connecting to the spirit of modern science. Our boxes with smart electronics are coming on board as co-pilots in education's hour of need. They are a portal that enables scientists to have a direct presence in the classroom and hopefully ignite a sense of wonder. On seeing some of the things our students were convinced were true, we too had a sense of wonder. This led to questions. Answering those questions led to a plan. Following the plan led to some discoveries, but mostly new perspectives and insights. When it came to wrap things up with conclusions, there came a realization, perhaps, it was the way teachers had been looking at conclusions was part of the bigger problem. Perhaps they see themselves as a parcel delivery service. The parcels are certified conclusions, the understanding behind them no longer delivered but lost in the distant behind them no longer delivered but lost in the distant past. You could describe this as dogma, but rather than just finding a label, our real concern was that there appeared to be a lack of understanding that this state of affairs could be leading to problems in the longer term. Base questions that frame the plan could we learn from the methods scientists use to identify misconceptions before they get into the publications and thereby develop more effective strategies for classroom teaching? Could smart electronics play a role in implementing these strategies? Could this be a decisive tactic in the battle to rein in the scores of non-scientific zombie concepts that stalk our schools? We believe that the answer to all these questions is yes. While working out the details, the strategy, the electronics and the quantum physics, it is important not to lose sight of the dire position education now finds itself in and as a result be insensible to the need to strike upon some sort of a strategic response. Substandard science is a toxin that has the same modus operandi as termite bait. The bait is softer than wood making it an irresistible, they can only eat more bait. Similarly, the use of poor quality easy to chew explanations conditions the teacher's mind so that once they have absorbed them, they then struggle to digest anything more complex in future. The termite colony is on borrowed time as the afflicted workers return to the nest to die, are cannibalized and so spread the toxin weakening the jaws of all. At no point are the termites able to work out what is happening to them and avert the certain doom. We explore some science demonstrations operated by inexpensive Arduino-based smart electronics. This enables the devices to respond and adapt to students and to connect to the internet. This is a small step in the direction of a more routine interaction with social robots. To capture the spirit of the concept, we propose the brand identity of scientist in the box. The hope is if it does indeed become possible to orchestrate how the demonstration operates then you can reduce the risk of inexpert explanations and increase the level of student engagement. In this paper we first frame the problem and a solution we have developed. Solution we have developed. The problem is insufficient expertise to accurately teach science and our solution is to hardwire in the deficit using smart electronics. The second section considers the significance of this solution. Does it have an impact on a genuine deficiency? Does it tackle the underlying problem? Is it affordable? The third section covers how the scientist in the box might perform in the classroom. Having identified the problem, then the feasibility of a solution, then the expanded role of smart electronics we reach the fourth section in which we report the specifics of three prototypes. Besides showing a toy duck dancing to Doctor Who music, a utility box of sensors and a pendulum swung by invisible quantum mechanical forces, the progress toward having an expert clearly explaining what is going on can be assessed. What's the problem? How likely is it that by the year 2040 science teachers are going to have a repertoire of lessons enabled by smart electronics, housed in plastic boxes? 
to find out we have built and road tested three prototypes that might well unfold not in today's classrooms but that of 2040. As a reasonable objective we've assumed that future students will be more fluent in quantum mechanics than those walking around in our schools today. Whether we are developing a new teaching process or planning a novel cake for a restaurant some of the considerations remain the same. What ingredients do we need? What do people currently consume? Customers have expectations, but what is the history that has transpired thus far and what is it that they could be thinking to make these particular expectations so important to them? How can we craft this new solution to be the natural successor of what has gone before? If you contrast today's world with life at the time of the pharaohs, it is not hard to notice some dramatic differences. Today we take for granted aeroplanes, hospitals and weather forecasting. These are just some of the areas for consideration, but you could think of many more. Almost any modern endeavor that you would care to imagine runs on the expertise of highly skilled professionals, pilots, doctors, and meteorologists to name but a few. They were not born with these specialist skills but acquired their capabilities later on in their lives. They undertook years of study. However, they first must have benefited from a general education so that they were able to process and assimilate their training. This in turn means they need to have encountered the essential education trifecta namely, skilled teachers using the right tools that covered the relevant content. You would assume by now we would have this starting point on target. The reality falls well short of this. There are many things that you would have taught the 1920s pilots, doctors and meteorologists that might still be applicable nowadays. This doesn't mean we are not obliged to modernize what we teach. There are some skills that were crucial in the 1920s that although quite interesting no longer remain relevant today. For example, how do you exit a cockpit in mid-flight and walk out on the wing to fix a spluttering engine, how do you amputate infected limbs, or what can you tell from cloud shapes? Yet observing a modern science lesson you will be struck how much of the content is pre-920. Many things have occurred since, but fundamental change at least in part is due to the use of computers to help us interpret the flow of information streaming from electronic sensors. Perhaps, it could be argued that the teaching profession is somehow fundamentally a different endeavor from pilots, doctors and meteorologists. Perhaps smart electronics will have a role more at the margins but the core flow of information into a student's head will remain the same. Perhaps the best we can hope for are the age-old textbook explanations that seem obvious and concise at the cost of letting through a few seemingly harmless misconceptions. Maybe we are locked into explanations that are throttled by the teacher's limited understanding. Perhaps. In this paper we propose a teacher by pass. We consider hitting the pause button on stream of consciousness simplifications. With smart electronics running things, the demonstrations figuratively speaking can work out when best to press their own play button and channel expert explanations direct to the students. We aim for an educational interaction. With smart electronics running things, the demonstrations figuratively speaking can work out when best to press their own play button and channel expert explanations direct to the students. We aim for an educational interaction that develops concepts that have been expertly simplified. The students still pass the next test, but care is taken to avoid inadvertently transmitting misconceptions to them. In computer parlance students don't download into their minds virus explanations that will eventually cause their cognitive operating system to crash. Passing comment on this malady Einstein said, simplify as much as possible but not further. The question of feasibility. If you had a brilliant aeronautical or medical breakthrough, perhaps you would be ill-advised to burst into a busy cockpit or operating theater and argue your case. You would be told, it is just not possible for us to drop what we are doing to put your idea into practice. Classroom teaching can be pictured as a cockpit crew fully engaged in navigating knowledge space or some kind of cognitive operating theater. Be well advised that having understood the prospective benefits of your breakthrough to pause and observe experts at their work, what is the language and thinking that they use? What is actually happening? To conceptualize what is going on in education you could picture it as a massive airport where none of the planes actually take off. Students are greeted as they board the aircraft. They are drilled in emergency procedures. The plane taxis for a while and then returns to the terminal. There are brochures about the holiday resort at Quantum Mechanics. The reality of this destination is empty streets with tumbleweeds blowing through. There have been no arrivals for quite some time now. You will find if you look deeply into education there is no one in charge. This is also true of science, but of this predicament, scientists are acutely aware. Experiments are designed to reveal the goings-on of nature. 
scientific candor, peer review and an open source culture are just some of the self-regulating behaviors that welcome all to understand and all to question. It is not surprising to a scientist to question. It is not surprising to a scientist that you should produce prototypes to put ideas to a fair test. In science you make your case to nature for all to see. In education the good and the bad ideas sing out at the same time competing with each other for attention. This generates a lot of background noise. Using the airport analogy, there is a large measure of being overwhelmed by the details and focusing on the departure board then reasoning that what may be proposed does not appear to be scheduled to be leaving anytime soon. With no one identifiable in charge you will encounter different groups. One group is the educational passengers known as students. It is important to get feedback from them. Some may be in the departure lounge, looking out the window watching the prototypes on the tarmac. Overhearing their reactions provides an indispensable resource to guide the coming design iterations so that as if by magic, they increasingly seem to meet student expectations. Another group is the teachers, and their responses have been diverse. Some have framed in terms of the current way we have been doing things. In this respect they are not unlike taxi drivers with their initial response to Uber or those in traditional print responding to Facebook. The wisdom of hindsight is that technology alone is not the last word on disruptive change. What is proposed must work and be cost-effective but there is also a key behavioral dimension to consider. The customer changes to think differently meaning they try out new ways of doing things. Technology is just an enabler. Initially all the focus is on the gadgets and the clever advances but at the end of the day customers say, I can send a parcel by Uber or I can update my status on Facebook. In this case it might be, I can be confident explanations that I give in class will not cause scientists to roll their eyes. The teacher's many practical questions boils down to three queries, is there a specific example where scientist in the box does something better than what we already do? Why would you want to use it? Is there going to be some hidden price catch? To pick out a key advantage, T of chemical elements of the periodic table are more stable when they have one extra electron. The negative ion is more stable than the neutral atom for most elements. This property is called the atom's electron affinity. When students become aware of this property, they will gain a more quantum mechanical feel for the atom and the electron. Note, the prototypes described in the paper don't cover electron affinity but what you are going to need to have in place to build an explanation. The alternative high school view that represents electrons as dots on the blackboard is unstable. It is an equivalent situation to seeing 2D cartoon pictures of coffee tables and then going on to build them in real life with only two legs. A two-legged table is unstable. Having addressed the first gatekeeping question of, is there some standout feature that we are going to see scientist in the box delivering, we come to the second question, why would you want to use this technique? As a starting point we could say our response to our environment is guided by our senses and what we imagine once the stimulus is no longer in front of us. Our senses and what we imagine once the stimulus is no longer in front of us. Our imagination allows us to run virtual simulations of our senses, and in our head rewind the tape so we take the appropriate next step. By way of explanation you could imagine the taste of a roast dinner and then imagine the steps leading up to that point and use this as a blueprint or manifest for the actions required to put the roast in the baking pan and turn on the oven hours before you have arranged for your friends to arrive having earlier shared your imaginings with them. What we are saying is that we want to move beyond this starting point of simply replaying simulations of our senses. Training hones the student's imagination. This process is on display when students sit written exams. Questions stimulate their imagination. What we actually assign grades for sounds rather complicated. How well does the student describe their response they imagine, to a situation we ask them to develop further? What we claim, as the fundamental reason for use of scientist in the box, is that it manages imagination sensitive explanations for ideas that the scientist in the box highlights, rather than obscures these treasures. Let us picture education as it reaches its high watermark in developing students' imaginative capacity. Think of educators as pilots at the controls of some form of cockpit. Things appear normal as students sit and pass their exams showing their imagination training is progressing well. The speed increases until there is vibration and warning lights appear. In this context we would recommend switching on scientist in the box and traveling at higher speed rather than dropping back to a slower speed. And never quite reaching our destination. Let us consider an activity looking at the aspects that progress from the concrete to the increasingly abstract. 
As an example of an entry-level concrete activity we may consider teaching students how to bake a cake, for this there are many direct sensory experiences that students mentally replay or imagine to guide the practice in the kitchen. They physically weigh the ingredients, mix, bake, cool, ice and finally eat the fruit of their labor, experiences that students mentally replay or imagine to guide the practice in the kitchen. They physically weigh the ingredients, mix, bake, cool, ice and finally eat the fruit of their labor. The next level deals with things that are not imaginable but are intelligible. How about buying the ingredients with money? Money has no weight, it is abstract. It is a social construct, a collective illusion. It has consequences you can go to jail if you steal it. It is teachable by association with things that you can imagine buying with it. So far education is doing well. In the next level beyond this we look at some of the other abstract tools used in cooking. Numbers help us to count how many eggs are required. The numbers themselves don't weigh anything, and like money they have an agreed meaning. Unlike money you can't steal it. Like money, numbers are abstract intelligible, but education has a link with what can be imagined. Endless hours are spent counting sheep, flowers and blocks. When the complexity advances to algebra we need to expand our number system to algebraic NAS of imaginary numbers which can give us the answer to the square root of minus one. We are not helped here by this name because real numbers can be linked to what we can imagine, whereas imaginary numbers cannot be imagined. So, if real numbers can be imagined, then non-real numbers can't be imagined. Needless to say, this is a high watermark that many teachers chuckle a bit at and then avoid. It is unfortunate then that in the 1920s it was discovered that atoms described by algebra were in fact a reality of algebraic numbers. For example, atoms of the cake can now be imaged in black and white and look like fuzzy balls. These balls are the electrons. Rather than avoiding each other they sit through each other. False color imaginary number phase can be added to a picture of a selected electron and its phase angle shown spinning through 360 degrees in slow motion. No part of an atom has any surfaces. Electrons fill the space of an atom like genies in a bottle. In fact, the trick is not imagining something which we finally understood was beyond human imagination. This was the key breakthrough of quantum mechanics, but unfortunately schools balked at this memo. So, in answer to the second question, you would want to use scientist in the box, so you don't inadvertently wind up on teaching quantum mechanics. The third practical question relates to cost. Although teachers tend not to comment directly, they often know of a friend who would insist that any new idea must be free, and further that it is effectively cheaper to run than the traditional demonstration. Such a demonstration has been bought years ago and now sits in a cardboard box on a shelf in the school storeroom. The first objection that comes to mind is, there is no room at the inn. The existing demonstrations are taking up all available shelf space. Perhaps therefore the market will be restricted to new schools although this is not the first time old product has built up in a system. Perhaps, like mobile phones or cars some kind of trade in arrangement might work. Then there is the observation that we haven't yet convinced some Steve Jobs or Elon Musk like wealthy celebrity figure to Steve Jobs or Elon Musk like wealthy celebrity figure to appear and give their personal endorsement with a high-powered product launch. This is true, but it is also true the scientist in the box is not a consumer product but rather a manifestation of Arduino and Raspberry Pi hobby kits that are themselves mature platforms. After the prototypes have been tested and ready for manufacture the objective is to create a brokerage site similar to building your own computer. A single order triggers multiple supplier sub-orders. In one scenario the parts could be choreographed to arrive at a summer vacation workshop for students to build. Ironically, scientist in the box may be thought of as paying some form of tribute to Jobs and Musk in that it uses smartphone technology, rechargeable batteries, and has a loose semblance to driverless technology in that units navigate around the education system by instructing staff to post them to the destinations that the units nominate on their electronic labels. Big technology does have a behind-the-scenes role to play in making this product effectively free or zero and the ideal birthday present for her relative, Sam. Her browser suggests a scientist in the box gift. Sam receives an introduction kit on the day and then selects from options a project that piques his, her attention. It is duly shipped. There is an optional discussion board with Martha that allows her to offer encouragement or to be kept up to date on what is happening. At the outset, Martha's Facebook friends are messaged to see if they would like to join in and contribute to the purchase of the present. Years pass, and as with any gift, it sits disused in Sam's parents' garage. If by whatever construct Sam's school won't accept what he, she has built, the, scientist in the box, demonstration could be shipped to another school, perhaps in another country. 
The transfer is arranged online with the box updating its shipping label and reporting its location via GPS. Up until this point the design features we describe are more or less standard. They are only novel in the education context. Electron Affinity EEA is well known, only it is overlooked by the current teaching frame. Mentioning the Bohr classical atom is equivalent to pointing out to a flat earther platogism, that shadows appear to be longer as one approaches the poles. Measuring your shadow length in Lapland, you wouldn't announce to the world that you have discovered some kind of new phenomena. Similarly, it is far from a recent revelation that electron wave functions need complex numbers to describe them. Use of trade in systems and Arduino kits are not new. It is more a case of it hasn't been done that way before for this situation. Teaching the Bohr atom is effectively a flat earth view of the atom. Pointing out that there is some problem with processing evidence doesn't advance the situation on a social level. It is a social dilemma. It is not unlike investigating an Amish crime scene and the suspect ridiculing DNA evidence. You are not required to first educate the suspect before you are able to lay charges. In a piece of music key changes alerts the listener that a new layer of meaning or a new perspective follows. This point in this paper marks the start of novel pra the musical piece the style stays the same. The scientist in the box demonstration will be shown to have features that reduce the hidden labor cost involved in getting the demonstration in front of the students. The act of retrieving and then returning demonstrations takes on a different character when the scale of the activity is considered. By analogy you could think of a single penguin coming ashore at Phillip Island on the south coast of Australia. It is a different thing to witness thousands of them jumping out of the surf after dusk each evening. Fortunately for the penguins they know where to go and parent and chick recognize each other's call. As a reasonable estimate each high school has to prepare 20 demonstrations a day from a store of 1000 and deliver them to the correct classroom at the correct time. Here is where the smart electronics comes into action. A key change in the tune of this explanation, all boxes have the same A4 footprint and are multiples of 25 mm high. These are made by welding a number of plastic document cases together. Having external power pads, they rack back charge. In sleep mode they periodically report their GPS and Wi-Fi strength triangulated position as well as their charge. Once a demonstration has been selected by a teacher in software, it wakes up and self-tests. When the laboratory assistant enters the room, the assistant says, OK, collection time. At which the first box lights up with the teacher's color and beeps, and if desired announces the teacher's name. The lesson particulars are printed on the electronic label that looks like a Kindle e-book. When the first one is selected and placed on a transfer trolley the second one lights up and so forth. Importantly, if in the lesson the unit is found to have a piece missing or broken then the teacher can talk into the box at the completion of the lesson to log a voice memo that then attaches an alert to the demonstration's control icon. Alternatively, if the demonstration is to be used in the next lesson at a different location it can ask to be put outside the classroom in the last 10 minutes of the lesson for pickup. Some of the solutions described here can be compared with the demonstration is to be used in the next lesson at a different location it can ask to be put outside the classroom in the last 10 minutes of the lesson for pickup. Some of the solutions described here can be compared with the equipment management systems used in healthcare. This has been steadily gathering pace for many years now. Tracking and in-situ telemetry has a large impact for busy hectic hospitals and is perhaps more of a burden for a small country hospital. The parallel education equipment system would have most impact for a senior STEM high school, but it may mean that smaller high schools could share resources and have a virtual collective science equipment store. The scientist in the box comes to class the discussion thus far has been about the scientist in the box wrap around for traditional demonstrations that doesn't move them conceptually too far beyond the way things have always been done. Interfacing with the education sector is a bit like talking to a crazy relative who hasn't understood that you are no longer at school. You explain to them that you have been working with auditors on the due diligence required for investment in your company. For investment in your company, your relative is not interested in this, but really wants to know if you are top of your primary school class. You are now well into your twenties. With a well-meaning smile, they hand you your party hat and pull back the curtain on the party table. See, all the other professionals are sitting there wearing their hats. The well-meaning relative is in their zone. The challenge is to address the social dimension of what you are doing, without challenging your relative and getting into a needless debate. To focus in on just the physical hardware aspect of scientist in the box alone let's call this aspect A. Does A show something novel? Does A use an approach that is currently missing in our repertoire? Is A affordable? Is A practical to use? 
All these have a positive answer. No red flag has been raised. We are free to continue, but the considerations have all been restricted to A which is limited to only the hardware aspect. What about A operated by social system B? How does this AB system function? Let us consider a few artifacts to order. There is the Melbourne Cup and the winning jockey holding it aloft. There is an upturned top hat and an expectant audience at a magic show. All these signify power, show who has the power, and have deep social buy-in and programmed timing in order for them to play out the scene we imagine for them. If at an archaeological dig you were to uncover a holy relic, a crown, a gavel, a Melbourne cup, and a magician's top hat, you would picture the social situations linked with them. You might become frustrated in forming a coherent narrative and you would be tempted to throw in the shovel. The only thing that might stop you is that your students are also trying to make sense of this collection and adding to it the scientist in the box. Perhaps we should see where they are up to. The first observation is that your modern student audience can swipe between social frameworks for entertainment. Whether it is an out-of-control cockpit, a penguin invasion or an archaeological dig they can pick up on information very quickly from chaos that would otherwise easily leave the older folk bewildered. The second observation is that the timing wielded. The second observation is that the timing and controls so critical for artifacts to work in a prescribed system can be more flexible once we loosen the constraints. The third observation is that computer gaming has changed the participation dynamic. The demonstration is seen in a game environment with levels and insights held in software for which the gamer develops an understanding. In deference to the description of computer games we will sketch out some gameplay. When the teacher orders the demonstration from a drop-down list of suggested items not only does the box self-test, but a red alert dot appears on the science learning icons on the student's phones and computers. They can now choose and complete a number of customized podcast tutorials that have been generated specially for them. These are read from a base text document by Natural Machine Speech. Google WaveNet offers cloud-based conversion using code that has been generated by machine learning algorithms. It is noticeably closer to natural speech and less work to understand, and less work to understand. Perhaps too, we are evolving to be more skilled in listening to personal assistance. The student can select the pitch, gender and accent that they find the easiest to understand. They can set the pace to speed up if they are to hear the material for a second time or slow down if they have to listen carefully to pick out key pieces of information. This is described as real-time audio rendering of a text document by a WaveNet plugin. The rendering engine synthesizes different podcasts by synthesizing selected sections from within a source text document. There are sections, introduction, concept explanation 1, question 1, correct answer 1, incorrect answer 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 and 1.3, concept explanation 2 and so forth. This is then diced, multiple choice options randomized and then spliced to produce a selection of podcast styles, introduction, lesson, general quiz, in which the correct answer is given directly after the response, adaptive quiz, and class quiz. For a class quiz the response paper student reflections to modify the core text as well as review long-term performance to diagnose and fine-tune the podcasts. Again, we are at a threshold of having contemporary ideas that simply have been missed in education and are now transitioning them into being generally accepted. The education system has come to the position that electron affinity is inconvenient and too much trouble. In the circumstances it is not novel to include what has been overlooked. Having demonstrations identify themselves in a storeroom and potentially be directing themselves to repair is novel. Getting text to be managed by software and having it audio rendered is enterprising but not novel in the field of computer games. Using phone keypads or voice recognition is also standard practice. Shaking the phone a set number of times to indicate an answer may be an interesting innovation. The potential for these podcasts to be listened to while on public transport to and from school, and to be integrated with computer consoles on exercise gym treadmills for mixed cognitive and physical training is an important on exercise gym treadmills for mixed cognitive and physical training is an important possible extension. It will most likely have a limited benefit for a selection of students for a limited time. Nonetheless, it is a benefit. Sophisticated classroom interaction promises to be a major development. Using the data collected from interactive podcasts the demonstration software will have the ability to address students using their preferred names and shape the demonstration to their strengths and weaknesses. Realization in three prototypes Why would you use a prototype? First, what is one? As students would do in class, let us consider what Wikipedia has to say. A prototype is an early sample, model, or release of a product built to test a concept or process. 
It is a term used in a variety of contexts, including semantics, design, electronics, and software programming. A prototype is generally used to evaluate a new design and to enhance precision by system analysis and by collecting responses from users. What this doesn't say but assumes is there is not from users. What this doesn't say but assumes is there is not already an existing commonly available form of the idea out there. You wouldn't say, look at my prototype coffee cup it holds hot coffee. But why use three prototypes? Further is it wise to give an answer to this question using a military metaphor when speaking to an education audience? For various reasons teachers find this style of thinking quite alien. Mechanized armor involves the idea of a coordinated strategy to shape the action on the battlefield. Here we are looking to do the same with education dynamics. The armor analogy also captures the idea of the sudden transformation in people's thinking once it was realized that operations could be better managed with radios in every vehicle. In this case, scientists in the box GPS and Wi-Fi capabilities are included for a nominal increase in cost. Armor also has well-established management of fuel, rechargeable power banks, battle readiness, self-test and repair in the field, e-paper labels to return units for repair. Armor in the field, e-paper labels to return units for repair. Armor is a good analogy in that it is clear to see that it is unwise to bundle all roles into one form of vehicle. A troop carrier, tank, self-propelled gun would struggle to optimize any one particular role. It is better to have specialist vehicles. Not all readers would be familiar with armor operations, but for those that are, the following description of armor is a useful scaffold with which to understand the prototype strategy. The troop carrier carries the troops to the operation area, primary school prototype. The infantry, debus, or get out to operate with tanks, secondary school science utility prototype. Having taken strategic ground, they enable self-propelled guns to engage at long range, university specialist prototype, what the analogy with mechanized strategy is particularly useful for is setting out the requirements to deploy and support capabilities. Prototype 1, Primary School Science If you were to ask a primary school student about this demonstration the first piece of information they would offer is plugged in the blue dance floor glows. When you touch the area of the box with a foil patch underneath it Doctor Who music plays which Gladys the Duck evidently hears and Waddle dances to. Further inquiry will reveal smooth transitioning from play to a more formal understanding as it is explained how Gladys got her magnet inside her. Gladys's transparent egg reveals it also has a magnet inside. It sits in a nest to the side of the large solenoid electromagnet duck pond. When placed in the pond it also joins in the revelry. Educators can see play and formal levels of interaction proceeding hand in hand. They inquire if the student knows that the current in the wire suddenly reverses with each note. The student response is worth contemplating. The music should be sung as quacks. We are endeavoring to engineer this feature. The student has many years education ahead of them, and now that they have a familiarity with the demonstration it then becomes a resource that they can revisit to add further layers of insight. What educators found surprising was that there were key concepts they felt that they as teachers had mastered, but later found that they had more to learn. The mapping of the solenoid's magnetic field builds a picture of how the field lines bend in three-dimensional space. It can be done with a gimbaled inclination compass. This device has two angular degrees of freedom and shows two angular dimensions of magnetic field direction, the azimuth or inclination to the horizon and somewhat confusingly named compass direction. Using the inclination compass away from the solenoid then shows the Earth's magnetic field inclination falls below the horizon by 64 degrees for Sydney, Australia. This is not a gentle dip, but a steep angle like the edge of a give way sign. If you were to conduct the experiment in a Colombo classroom in Sri Lanka, you would measure near zero degrees. Your local inclination can be found from www.magnetic-declination.com. There is a pushback by teachers concerned that in order to explain the prototype capability a lot of basic science needs to be covered. There is a general skept covered. There is a general skepticism that this understanding is going to turn out to be significant. Declination refers to the angle between rotational or true north and compass north. The town of Thap Thiang in Thailand has small magnetic inclination and declination. The latter is due in a large part because the town, rotational and magnetic poles can be found on a great circle. The additional levels of complexity and understanding cannot be dismissed as applying to magnetism only. Of note there is a difference between gravitational plumb bob down and rotational down. That is if you were to drop an apple it does not fall to the center of the earth. 
For Greenwich this deviation is about one thousandth of a degree meaning the Greenwich Meridian is marked in error closer to Australia by 102 meters 5 cricket pitches. Having found the property of magnetic field direction has some complexity, it may not be so disquieting to find that there is some detail yet to understand with field strength. The strength of the magnetic field at different points in the solenoid can be for this is a field strength chip. It is important to note that the solid state physics that is behind how the chip detects magnetic fields is built on quantum physics that is not accessible through the non-quantum treatment of science currently found in schools. If you do measure the field strength with a field strength probe you will find that the maximum is in the center of the coil midway down. The strength is reasonably uniform across this region because of its large diameter and reasonable length of the coil. Most educators, having not had previous access to a large solenoid are surprised to find that there is little or no force on a magnet held near the center of the solenoid where the field strength is maximum while the force is noticeably stronger near the coiled wire circumference. This is because what they are holding is a magnetic dipole, north, south, and the force on this is proportional not to the field strength but to the field gradient. This topic is littered with misconceptions and errors. Monopoles, current carrying wires cutting field lines, and even magnetic pressure exerted by a bunching of field lines are just a few of the that create a legacy of hazy science that we gift our students. But is it all that important to know that it is the magnetic field gradients that exert forces on magnets? It is if you wish to understand quantum physics. In 1922 when Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach fired a beam of electrons into a steep magnetic field gradient the beam split into two streams. Electrons had charge, but they proved they were also tiny magnets. There was nothing mechanical holding them in a certain orientation, but they were not free to spin to point north like a compass. Compasses have friction to settle the needle direction. The electrons, somewhat weirdly, were stuck either pointing along the field line drifting north or against it drifting south. Welcome to quantum physics. Let us propose that we design a mock-up of the stern gerlach demonstration with materials we could source from a hardware shop. We could order neodymium supermagnet spheres and use compressed air to fire a stream of them fed by a screw mechanism into a barrel. We could have a powerful system of electrom powerful system of electromagnets that switches the field with every ball fired so that it streams out north, south, north, south. Some other contrivance could spin up these ball magnets. Would this mean we could get the stern gerlach experiment splitting the electrons into two beams when fired through the edge of our solenoid where there is greatest gradient and force on the magnet dipole? Perhaps, questions would be asked before this point about the expense, whether it might be pushing the boundaries of a deception and at what point it would be simpler to build the actual experiment. If such a hardware-based demonstration were built, we would diplomatically commend the intention of communication but point out that it critically misrepresents the electron to the extent that it unteaches quantum mechanics. Firstly, electrons have no surfaces, no inside or outside. Secondly, it does not have the symmetry of a ball bearing SU3. Rather it has SU2 symmetry this means it has to rotate 720 degrees rather than 360 degrees in order to look the same. It can't flip or spin as it, as it has no parts that would show this was happening, analogous to a chalk mark on a tire. It doesn't have a smaller bit to place a mark on. It travels around as if it has a flywheel inside, but it has no parts and is not spinning. This has been described as spinning in a hidden dimension we cannot imagine. We call it a fundamental property meaning nothing is causing it. The closest physical model you might hold in your hand that shows some of its character is a Mobius strip that has 720 degree symmetry and two twist states. A little less close is a pretzel that has a central clockwise or anti-clockwise twist of the dough. The model that gives the most accurate idea of being able to change orientation but without the pole passing through the equator is a sock. You can hang it toe down reach inside and pull it inside out so the toe points up. A clockwise arrow on the inside can change to an anti-clockwise arrow on the outside. The sock not actually spinning is a more accurate representation. Further detail can be added by having the clockwise arrow on the outside. The sock not actually spinning is a more accurate representation. Further detail can be added by having the small sock with a magnet in the toe hit small bells at either end of its travel. The sound wave radiating out on each spin flip represents the light photon emitted. It is not visible light but long wavelength radio and microwaves. You cannot see the light signals, but in the model, you can hear the signal. The significance of turning anything into a miniature mobile phone in a magnetic field will not be lost on the students. Mobile phones transmit through walls. 
In a school, students could like or dislike lessons, and their votes could be combined with their phone location to generate a 3D map revealing where the coolest or the least inspiring teaching is going on. While this situation is fictional, it fairly describes how MRI machines detect stroke areas of the brain by getting the brain to produce spin-flip radio waves that travel through the walls of the brain, the skull. As a brief note MRI use the magnet skull. As a brief note MRI use the magnetic effects not of electrons but protons, but the SU2 symmetry and spin flips but not in a way anyone is capable of imagining still holds true. As the name magnetic resonance imaging suggests it detects a coordinated or resonant radio transmission or spin echo. So, after GLADIS, inclination probes, intensity probes, dipole probes we are constructing a magnetic sock to faithfully represent the quantum electron. And there is more that can be done. An induction probe coil can show flashes on LEDs when the field suddenly changes. Faraday's law of induction means that a loop of conducting wire will be effectively a battery with a voltage generated proportional to the rate of change of magnetic field, the area of the loop and the number of coils. Hook this up to a light bulb and this will blink with the field changes of the duck pond. It will flash with each note. This links to transcranial magnetic stimulation brain therapy that is dramatically shown when a coil of roughly the same diameter and current wave inducing neural activity in the brain which is seen as a limb or facial convulsion. So, what do you think of Gladys? What level of depth and complexity do you stop and say, Gladys that is enough? Is induction too much to teach? Maybe there is some line where you could mention induction cooktops and wireless charging but avoid mentioning putting the induction coil on your head and causing convulsions. Does a scientist's assessment of a teacher's ability to answer these questions really matter? You might think of a scientist in the same light as a bank manager who is assessing someone's suitability for a loan. The bank manager in your opinion is going into too much detail and appears to be overly concerned about a bit of social gambling. The manager's concern about gambling is not moral. It is more about trying to get into the mind of the client. Social gambling looks like earning income, the activity pulling the lever on poker machine takes effort but it's not productive work that fits well with the narrative of repaying the loan. Teaching that induction can be explained because this is the equation needs effort to induction can be explained because this is the equation needs effort to learn, but it is not understanding. At the end of the day we are saying that a famous person discovered it, and ever since students have been getting the right answer if they used the equation, the wrong one if they didn't. This is the best you can do with schoolbook empty space which has its origins in Middle Ages theology of angels and side steps the physical properties of vacuum that can transmit light, angular momentum, and store energy. Insight into this is where Gladys and the scientist in the box are going. Prototype 2, secondary school science Not everyone who sees a prototype on the laboratory benchtop can go on to visualize how it will function with trained users and support infrastructure. What follows is a description with some of the functionality and modes of use sketched in. If you were to ask a secondary school student about this demonstration the first piece of information they would offer is that the scientist in a box works just like Batman's utility belt, only it is not a belt but a box complete with retro telephone handset, and that you are able to borrow the it is not a belt but a box complete with retro telephone handset, and that you are able to borrow the utility box from most libraries in the same way you would borrow a book. Advice that you could well give the student is that any reference to pop culture in a formal setting such as an exam is probably not the best strategy. Examiners are likely to misunderstand. The student could show on their phone a video compilation of the Cape Crusaders resolving problem after problem with a surprising variety of gadgets they pull out of Batman's utility belt. The prototype utility box has five solid state and five thermocouple temperature sensors, a pH sensor, two gas pressure sensors, three weight scales that combine to monitor the mass of a beaker whilst on a tripod, two motorized precision liquid delivery syringes, a magnetic field probe and more. The sensors were selected because of economic and technical considerations. At an indicative cost of $5 each there is significant discounts when ordered in multiples. As one is able to reconstruct the many gadgets that are found in Batman's UX books, reading through experiments and expanding the list of sensors that would handle each documented activity. A combination solution of the utility box with accessible sensors that the students handle, and the Texas Instrument sensor tile with its integrated sensors covers nearly all experiments we have reviewed so far. The sensor tile is essentially a miniaturized utility box with the sensors embedded on the chip. Many of the sensors are MEMS, microelectromechanical systems etched out of the silicon crystal of the chip. Two such tiles would be inside the utility box, able to be taken out and placed in dynamics trolleys and the like. 
From a student perspective the tiles look like additional wireless sensors of the box, itself battery powered and wireless. The solid state temperature sensors have common power and signal wires. They measure, compute and store their temperature. On startup the signal line sends a request for all sensor chips to identify themselves with a the unique serial number. Thus, the software can ask for the temperature from any chip it nominates, all through a single data line. The software can ask for the temperature from any chip it nominates, all through a single data line. Thermocouples have a greater temperature range, and a fast fraction of a second response time. Different types of sensors each have the particular strong points to recommend them. Hence the selection of a combination of sensors, solid state and thermocouple. The solid state compares temperature performance of a high and low current transistor on the chip. The thermal couple can be understood through quantum mechanics and can be thought of as a battery for which the tiny voltage can be measured. If you put a nail in a flame, electrons will move to the cooler end making a battery. This is called the thermoelectric or Seebeck effect. A thermocouple is in fact two batteries with different alloys and temperature performance. We get to measure and compare the pole end back in the box whilst the probe end is just shorted together. This means several things, two wires shorted together as a sensor is quite a simple and robust device and there is a high temperature variety that can be plunged into a bunch of solid state sensors telling you the temperature inside the box. Finally, you can increase the sensitivity by connecting thermocouples in series. Our tests find that about a group of eight thermocouples is about optimum and enables you to see 0.05 degrees Celsius increases in temperature when table salt is added to a beaker or if it is heated by stirring. Multi-thermocouples have the drawback of expense and the bundle of wires is more cumbersome. The increased sensitivity and number of probes leads to a clearer view. The situation could be likened to comparing the underwater view with the water in direct contact with your eyes and the sharper images seen when you have goggles. When heating a beaker of water probes on the tripod, flame, bottom, top and above the beaker give a clearer finer grain view of what is going on. Having redundant sensors, say on each tripod leg and sensors always running allows a story to be unpacked. A student's notes could read, at 220 seconds the flame was lit, the legs heated up slightly differently as the flame was not scented, as the flame was not scented. Having different sensors concurrently measuring can show further aspects. The mass held in the beaker drops as the water evaporates. With appropriate fixtures the pressure of the steam could be measured. The temperature dependence of the pH of aspirin would be an interesting study. The addition of automated syringes allows an acid-base titration curve to be explored. If you neutralize trivalent phosphoric acid the graph of pH against volume of base added, then the curve generated has multiple inflection points showing the pH buffering effect. Teachers having had exposure to standalone sensors imagine a connection of the power to each sensor and the wiring and management to get the readings out seem at first glance to mean a spaghetti of wires shrouding any experiment. Each sensor means more time more to manage and more risk meaning the odds of a single experiment working in the room wanes. At some point between 1 and 15 experiments for a class we cross over to the impossible. There are at maximum 4 wall power outlets per experimental setup. Experiment working in the room wanes. At some point between 1 and 15 experiments for a class we cross over to the impossible. There are at maximum 4 wall power outlets per experimental setup. For this not to be the case there must be some key differences. Plugging into the wall, the sensors are battery powered. An array of meter boxes for each sensor. All sensors source to the one utility box, all data is streamed to a website. Fault correction for broken sensors, or poorly positioned sensors. Sensors self-test then are on continuously streaming data once the lid is opened. Students are able to text and voice message their data and so place annotated speech bubbles on the experiments table and graph. One can imagine problems that would crop up if you suddenly gave traditionally schooled students a complex task and a complex instrument. This is not the thesis of this paper. Notionally students would have been exposed to the primary school version of this box and would have learned to explore and test the functionality. Some students would have raised themselves with the unit when an older sibling brought it home for an experiment. The key enabler in boosting student confidence is the use of the unit in automated external defibrillator style mode. Here students are coached by unit voice instructions step by step. In a noisy classroom environment, the retro handset is used. This provides for venues and modes that vary from the traditional classroom, homeschooling, lunch, before or after school or as independent activities. Another aspiration is that it becomes a globally developed platform. 
different components, the teaching script for automated podcasts, the lesson instruction, the topics for investigation are all open source. All have potential to fall from popularity if they lack merit or if they do have merit gain in popularity. If they are somewhere in between they can be refined. It is also possible to reframe experimental science starting a few steps away from the formulation of the English experimentalists with the idea of confining experiments to supporting or refuting a hypothesis. This, this sees the role of experiments as a quality control procedure of thought. Instead taking a broader approach we could say that scientific measurement is an undertaking directed towards guiding human endeavor. I measure the temperature of boiling water in an endeavor to become more knowledgeable about nature. I read the power meter for an electricity company in an endeavor to charge customers. This is less cumbersome than shoehorning every situation into a hypothesis and an inauthentic exercise in inductive logic. Prototype 3, university level demonstration This third prototype occupies a conceptual space to some extent framed by the scope and design of its two predecessors. It is natural to first address the physical attributes, however its psychological presence looms high in the minds of two key stakeholders, the teachers and the students. From the teacher's perspective there is an overwhelming sense of being hacked. You can almost hear in some ivory tower somewhere, we've been hacked. What vulnerability have they exploited? Apparently we haven't actually understood basic science or changing the children. How bad can it get? It is almost as if after watching us do exactly the same thing for over 100 years, they know our very next move. They are using pop culture and fake news to invent fictional characters to hijack our control of communication. From the student's perspective there will be naturally a pop culture insight. Leading up to this there has been Gladys the Duck, and the utility box. The Einstein de Haas pendulum surely has a pop culture alias so students can mentally bookmark this concept for future reference as the dynamics of the universe in which it exists is constructed. Here the term universe is used in a popular culture context like Pokemon, DC, and Marvel universes. Part of the unwritten grammar of pop culture is that key gadgets have their features, but importantly these features play a defining role in the unfolding narrative. Gladys might be seen as a member of a subversive cadre of ducks. Students will know, got any grapes. Batman's utility belt is not just about gadget, a key role in a coming plot twist. On a practical level this means reverse engineering a science lesson to provoke a crisis. This involves a clinical assessment of something obvious, profound and outside the net of concepts currently in play. It required months of garage development. And lo, we now have a quantum pendulum on the shelf. The crisis unfolds at the end of semester when the science teacher fields these questions from their students, would an object made of ceramic so it couldn't conduct, rock about the axis of a magnetic field passing through it? Can a light beam carry a twisting force in it? What do you think of those people who say we live in a double image of two universes but you have to know where to look to see the evidence of this? On hearing these questions, our notional teacher could have a number of responses, each of which would lead the students in different directions. We have tried to capture as many variations as possible. All permutations have to respond to the situation after the holidays when the student walks into the class with an Einstein de Haas pendulum they have ordered online and then a class with an Einstein de Haas pendulum they have ordered online and then assembled. Is this not a ceramic rocking about a magnetic field line? Do things not rock when they emit or absorb light, and this rock resides in empty space the light travels through? Does the fact exact copies of matter, save for the spin, sit through each other in space imply we are living in a double image universe? And one more question what exactly is the system of thinking that you have been basing the ideas you have been teaching us? This is a contrived situation. Rather than arising from chance, the limited scope of teaching was considered and provided research objectives to move beyond these limits. Was it possible to systematically resolve technical issues so to place a demonstration of quantum mechanics in the hands of students? One that sounds the alarm on the half-mock science taught. A condensed account of those issues will be given, the quantum pendulum, one that comes from the hands of Einstein, and his trusty Dutch offsider de Haas has the comic book mystique of say Captain America and his World War II call to action. It has elements of being a key gadget like the gadget like the flux capacitor of Back to the Future. Indeed, the magnetic field flux reverses. While the proton torpedoes of Star Wars are beyond the scrutiny of Earth-bound scientists by being in the galaxy far far away, they are just as problematic as any pop culture concept structures. They are a gadget highly valued by the rebels and empire alike. Luke fires them to destroy the Death Star. There is formidable opposition. Luke has to fly into the heart of the Death Star with his gadget. 
he has the force, but not let's forget the relationship with his droid, R2-D2. Being aware of the sense of drama, it should be owned that the laboratory in which the quantum pendulum was built was not actually a stage set. It could have been a movie scene in which the downed pilot is carrying out repairs with screwdrivers and something hard to identify but obviously electronic. Not working. Why is that? The pendulum designed to spin, also bounces and sways. Thought bubble, I must control this pendulum, the future of all students depends on it. Child playing with a two-string color wheel. R, fix the pendulum top and bottom, make the wire light, taut but bringing the weight into a home position. Time passes as calendar dates fall revealing two months pass as concept prototype, gives way to research prototype and finally production prototype where the dials are turned up to danger and the apparatus blows up. Finally, I have it. In 1917 Einstein and has used an iron rod that had an oscillation period of 10 seconds. A combination of using ferrite a magnetic ceramic type used discovered in 1950 and the double torsion suspension increased the oscillation rate 300-fold, miniaturized it and exploited solid-state electronics to provide timing control to one millionth of a second. This was all routinely developed through the prototyping process. Each time the field is reversed down the axis of the ferrite cylinder the electrons flip the spin and give the pendulum a kick. The electron is effectively a flywheel which is upended. The process is similar to swinging to higher heights on a chilled reverse down the axis of the ferrite cylinder the electrons flip the spin and give the pendulum a kick. The electron is effectively a flywheel which is upended. The process is similar to swinging to higher heights on a children's playground swing, where it is your legs providing the push rather than in the case of the ferrite the electrons giving an angular kick. As with the playground swing, your eventual height or angle you swing through is governed by the frictional loss of the hinge couplings. For the model these have been designed by selection of material of the wire and the attachment to be low loss. This enables a small push to build up to a large angle swing, but this means it has to tune to a narrow frequency range. The swing is shown by a laser that hits a mirror on the pendulum and exits the clear roof of the box. This leads to a single laser dot on the ceiling. The frequency is displayed and as it sweeps through resonance, the dot grows to a maximum line and then reduces. Trials with students and lecturers guided the addition of frequency sweep controls and the ability to choose between materials, glass, copper and ferrite. Will bore atom and teachers reading and mediating a prescribed interpretation is realistically the best we can do. It creates a base level familiarity and requires only hiring teachers with the existing skill level. Proposed conclusion, three-dimensional quantum mechanics involves complex numbers and objects sitting through each other in space. To instruct this it is suggested to develop a form of social robot that has a low-key presence in different forms throughout education. The system will effectively team teach with expert guidance. The dilemma is you can't do both, and be effective. A disinterested observer would note that perceptions and frame of mind influence each other, to select which conclusion path is followed. If you have a worldview that conclusions just somehow emerge and gain social acceptance, making it too costly to take a different approach, you can see teaching a deemed solution as a practical establishment service to students. Pop culture presents entertaining and though provoking systems of deemed solutions. There is often a science laboratory or mystical knowledge, solutions. There is often a science laboratory or mystical knowledge that generate alternatives to our reality that part of the escapism. In the Bohr atom, empty space and liquid drop nucleus with a cluster of solid sphere neutrons and protons strands on its scientific merit. It is not used by scientists today. It is the behaviors and culture that surround it that suggest it is a pop culture phenomenon that has gone mainstream. One of many. In overview to respond to external challenges, you observe and analyze, communicate, proposed action. If there is no change of action, either there is no new perspective being fed into the system or some or all aspects of the analyze, communicate, proposition process needs attention. It is proposed that there are different flavors of conclusion, prescribed, scientific, moral, judicial, analytical, summary, and strategic. The current solution is closest to prescribed, while the proposed is strategic.